you can't freelance, you can't make money unless we get to take some of it. And I think that that's a really crappy policy. I think that in Fiverr's defense for that, the world is full of nonprofits and NGOs that provide services to people because they think it's a good thing to do. And this company isn't one of those. And that means that they're not our friends and shouldn't be treated as a friend. Hey, I'm Carrie. Welcome back to my channel or welcome for the first time. All around, welcome. I'm Carrie Blogger, a career freelancer on Fiverr.com where I've been selling as a Fiverr Pro verified copywriter for about the past eight years. And in today's Freelance Friday video, I am interviewing another Fiverr seller to discuss a very deep, serious, and somewhat very controversial topic. I hope that this is constructive feedback to show what we expect, need, want, see for the future and how Fiverr can continue to grow as a platform to better serve everyone involved. Let's get into it. I'm excited. So it's gonna be a long video. Heads up, strap it. It's like a FBI witness protection program as possible. Yeah, good. <laughs> so looking at Fiverr specifically as a platform, clearly they are kind of the liaison or facilitator between sellers and buyers. Which of those two groups do you feel like Fiverr values most? Uh, I don't think it values either group at all. Um, they treat sellers as a sort of as, as a cheap labor pool that they can use in any way they like. And I think they treat buyers the same way most big companies treat clients, which is to say, you know, a bunch of rooms to be manipulated as directly as possible and handing over as much cash as possible. So I'd say the experience is, is negative on both sides. And I think that Fiverr does as little as they can to support either group. I was going into this thinking my answer was going to be that they they must support buyers more because it was originally designed from a buyer's perspective. Reading Micah Kaufman's founder story, he came up with Fiverr because he needed to find a seller who could help him with this project. And so he started being a buyer. And I see that shown up in ways of like how much easier it is to purchase than it is to sell, how much easier it is to add extra yes. things to an order. It's not even possible to remove things from an order. Everything is always going towards the monetary of it being a successful transaction and that there's really not stuff in place for sellers to make sure that if it's not going to be a successful transaction, how do I back out? How do I decline? Yeah. How do I take care of myself in that? So what is your experience with Fiverr? How long have you sold on the platform? Have you also offered other services elsewhere? Yeah, so I've been on Fiverr for about two and a half years, um, which is roughly when I started freelancing. And I've been on Fiverr that whole time, and Fiverr has been my primary lead generation mechanism for about two years. I've consistently done about 15% of my work on Upwork, 10-ish percent uh, off-platform. For a while, I worked for Wordvice, which is a sort of an on-demand editing service. And I tried Freelancer.com with absolutely catastrophic results, extremely low rates, like one to two cents per word. So where did you first start working or how did you first get into the freelance side of things? I started on Upwork, I think. I was trying to find ways to support myself while I finished writing up my dissertation. So Upwork was first because uh, it's a little bit easier to sort of self-start there because so much of it is organized around pitching yourself to clients. Fiverr, of course, has the sort of snowball effect where once you get orders coming in, the platform works pretty well to continue bringing orders in. But if you don't have any reviews and no clients, then no one's ever going to see you. So, and of course, Fiverr does technically have a pitch yourself to buyers yeah. feature. It just is underutilized and kind of hidden and frankly more of a mess than Upwork is, which is really saying something. Yeah. <laughs> so my story is very different from yours because I've only ever sold on Fiverr. That's 100% where all of my work has come from. The, f the first time I'd ever heard of the concept of freelancing or even working online as like an actual career was for Fiverr. I'm in such a privileged position to be making as much money as I am, to have stable, consistent income. So for me, when I look at how I feel about Fiverr, it's, it's positive. If we give Fiverr the benefit of the doubt, if we say, you know, they really are here to facilitate the future of work and make it easier to connect with buyers and anyone can do this. So which of Fiverr's tools or features do you think are most valuable to you specifically as a seller? So for benefits, I've got three here. Uh, one is we get the ability to post our profiles um, on their website and sort of market ourselves to their whole buyer pool. Although the profile we can create is very limited. Two, marketing and lead generation. Three, payment protection. Um, that tends to reassure buyers and makes it easier to make sales. And then there's basically just two others, which are the badges and then the reviews. For me, the built-in marketing is the number one thing because I've never marketed myself mm -hmm. ever. I got discovered by, you know, the algorithm or editors or however I ended up in a prime position on the homepage. <laughs> the ghost. <laughs> the ghost that made it all happen. And from there, it has 
It has <laughs> never stopped. And I am so grateful to the platform for just connecting me and giving me that access to that resource. A question later on is I don't think that I could maintain the same volume and type of yeah. work that I'm doing off platform because I just simply don't have access to a literal world of people who are looking for what I what I do. If Fiverr was just a tool with all of these tools in it, even aside from the marketing, I think I would really, really value it. Having everything saved for me. I can look at an order from three years ago and download the document even if I've lost it on my computer. The way that the site structures the history of what we've done on the platform is actually really effective. I think I agree. The automated payments and fraud protection too, 100%. Strongest yeah. value point for me. I literally probably have been saved six thousand dollars at least. It, I totally agree, and I, and I agree that that's just flat out a good feature. That's that's just an upside. It is kind of quirky. I've had weird things happen. Fiverr tries to protect me, but it selects the wrong order and it ignores the tip, and I end up with like thirty percent of what I was supposed to get, and I have to go through an arbitration process. Mm. And like, there are some weird quirks in the system, but that's just those kinds of things are are going to happen. And it's robots trying to make decisions and make sure that they're right. I think that Fiverr needs to follow that <laughs> up. Cool yeah. Fiverr needs to follow that up with better customer service and human focused service to actually like override the robot automation that doesn't always work and give us more of like a personal liaison of someone you can trust and actually get answers from. Right. Right. Which of Fiverr's Rules, tools, features, do you most dislike that you have the biggest beef with? <laughs> There's a whole long list. Every seller is constantly at risk of losing their livelihood on the platform. If we pause and step back and prioritize anything other than Fiverr, you'd have to build back basically from zero. Uh, and I think putting that pressure on freelancers and prioritizing, you know, constant turnover and number of orders and order size and response time as metrics of seller quality and as a gateway to showing up in search results is just some hellish combination of cruel, discriminatory, and should be illegal. I'm going to challenge you. Have you personally experienced the going on vacation, pausing, and being penalized for it? Your reviews still are there. Your gigs are still there. You might have to update for the current market. But I, I don't see how necessarily if you, if you do it the right way and pause <clears throat> with warning that the platform does not allow you to do that. I, I think, anecdotally, I think I've noticed dips in number of incoming order requests after I've been on vacation. Um, I know that, you know, you're at orders per day, orders over the last six months, size of order, completion time per order, uh, number of cancellations, something about reviews. I don't know which review measures. I know those all factor into search ranking. Yeah, because I've also, I've heard the rumor of all rumors on Fiverr is that, right. oh, you, you die if you go on vacation. And I've taken off months at a time. Well, not months. I mean, I've taken off a month multiple times. And, Interesting. And I've paused all but one gig and gone on vacation. And my mm -hmm. response time goes down to like six hours because I'm traveling through Europe and my top priority is not answering my Fiverr messages. Yeah. And every single time, the second that it, it that I turn things back on and go back to work, I'm fine. So I'm I'm always really curious why I hear that rumor so much, but no one I've ever talked to has had a clear reason. So I don't know if it's just a rumor that everyone hears from someone else, hears from someone else or what. Again, this is, this is sort of a hearsay thing. I've not been banned myself, uh, but I know that at least early on, they would ban you for sharing a personal website or any form of off-platform communication mm -hmm. uh, with very few exceptions. For pro sellers, of course, we are now allowed to do whatever we want. Yeah. In principle, we can't take business off-platform and on camera, I have never done that. <laughs> Again, it's a policy where they're saying, look, you can't freelance, you can't make money unless we get to take some of it. And I think that that's a really crappy policy. I think that in Fiverr's defense for that, I see it personally as almost like a rental for all the features that Fiverr hmm. offers me. I don't think that the, the scale of what I pay for that rental is equivalent to the scale of what a new seller pays for their rental, but I'm... I'm accessing the pool of talent. I'm accessing the centralized system. I'm accessing payment protection. I'm accessing all of those tools and that that's just my fee to use it. So if I used it to access the inbox and their clients and all of the other features, mm -hmm. and then I took it off platform and Fiverr didn't get their cut, then I'm essentially not paying them for the services that they've already provided to me. So that's interesting. I think that I pay Fiverr 10 times what their services are worth. I agree that I pay too much. I think that if Fiverr was a platform designed for sellers or for buyers or both, then they wouldn't care. 
they would be trying to provide as many services as they could for as cheaply as they could. Uh, and the fact that they ban people for communicating off platform or bringing business off platform is the clearest evidence I can think of that they are a platform designed to create profit for a company, which like obviously they are, of course they are. Um, but I think that's a really crappy thing to be. And I think that the world is full of nonprofits and NGOs that provide services to people because they think it's a good thing to do. And this company isn't one of those. And that means that they're not our friends and shouldn't be treated as a yeah. friend. For context, Upwork drops their cut down to 10%. It starts at 20, drops to 10 after $500 with a client and then drops down to 5%. I've, I've pitched that to Fiverr people so many times. Ditto. This is a percentage that's not that far off what I pay in taxes. And for taxes, I get the entire infrastructure of the country and the entire military yeah. and our whole network of social benefits. And from Fiverr, I get like shitty email and an escrow system. So I already said, no, I don't think that I could maintain and attract the kind of work. Right. Do you think that off-platform, given everything else you're doing, you would be just fine? I think my business would be radically different if I had to build it off-platform. I think I probably would make less money, but I'm not sure if it would be dramatically less. Uh, I think I would be much more stable long-term. I think I would be much less dependent on a particular platform that can, you know, as we've been discussing, completely change how they work, thereby destroying both of our careers. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what my career would look like without Fiverr and whether it'd be off platform. And I do think that means Fiverr provides a really meaningful benefit, but I wouldn't want to confuse that with Fiverr being a pro seller. As, a, as like a quick metaphor, the US has a food stamps program called SNAP. SNAP is essential to a lot of people feeding their families right now. It's also really radically, aggressively anti-poor people, proving constantly that you don't have any family support, that you don't have a job. You have to be applying for jobs and not getting them. Like there's all these ridiculous stringent requirements to qualify for literally life-saving nutritional assistance. So SNAP is essential and provides a core benefit, but it's still, you know, making people's lives much worse than it should be. I think something similar is going on here where Fiverr provides a phenomenal set of benefits, but I really wish it was trying to help sellers rather than trying to make money. Okay. So the sticking point that started this whole conversation with you and I, yes, the infamous doer campaign. Got an idea? Isn't that cute? My little sister has ideas. You, you have a business to build. So I'm, me home mom. So get a logo, make a website, market it, promote it, promote the crap out of it. Cancel the brainstorm. The only one who can do this is you and your power to get shit done. So I can do it. Pitch it to your mom, pitch it to your ex, pitch it to your roommate, pitch it to anyone who will listen. But definitely don't pitch it to these guys. Woo the customer, schmooze the customer, and always be available. Oh, and this guy? Just ignore him. Beat the gurus, beat the trust fund kids, beat the tech bros. Nice scooter, yo. Change the business, change the industry, change everything. And while you're at it, save the rhinos. Above all, and this is important, do. Because thinking big, it's still just thinking. I've heard a little bit of your thoughts <laughs> about, you know, how yeah. freelance work was portrayed. Concept quickly got axed and then they moved on <laughs> when they saw people didn't like it. I think the campaign was a well-funded, large-scale piece of public advertising that glorified self-destruction. I think it was unethical. I think it, <laughs> I think it was as bad a bad an ad campaign as you can make. I think that... It's almost like they had a good, solid idea grounded in reality. And then it got mm -hmm. so stylized that it got completely blown out of proportion to a point that it was unhealthy and unsustainable. There's one scene in one of the clips. I could only find one on YouTube, but I do remember seeing them where the person is in bed with a partner and their phone buzzes and they roll over and check it. Woo the customer, schmooze the customer and always be available. What the heck? Like, no one should live like that. No one should ever want or have to live like that. But I think that the point they were right. making was that in a global community of working with people, like, there is mm -hmm. no strict timeline of when work happens. And I think that that can be positive. That's interesting. I, I hear that. I think that's a really good analysis. I also think I disagree. Work at any time is inherently risky because I think work is bad. Mm -hmm. I think that the only way that can be a good thing is if you work really hard to protect people. I think if the protections aren't there by default, it's a negative. For me personally, I don't want to work all the time. Like I literally have like a note up here that's like, you are worth more than your workload. And if you're not pumped about a project, say no. You don't have to do it, right? Cool. People have to be protected and 
taught to feel that way because I had to do a lot of self-teaching to convince myself that this is fine. But now that I've now that I've got it and with those kinds of mental health supports in place, the flexibility is fine because I'm not working all the time. That's the positive part of that messaging that I see like nestled in there, but it's not grounded in health and support and sustainability. For me, one more thing to add that I think is the most yeah. the most frustrating or feels anti-seller is the language and the visuals that they use to signal changes in the order to me. So for example, when a client requests modification, my blood pressure goes up because it's bright red. It emails me, it texts me, it notifies me. And yes. I open it and I'm like, oh my God, yes. oh my God, oh my God. And then it's like, hey, I love this. I just want to check this one thing. The process is so stress inducing. And, and the notifications that Fiverr is sending of, hey, someone just sent you a message. You need to reply to yeah. this immediately. I'm like, can you at least show me a preview of what they said and then I'll decide if I need to get back to them? Because that's how it used exactly. to be. And I complained about it when they changed it to that little preview message. I think the stress is deliberate and I think they're doing that to keep us engaged and keep us working as hard as they can get us to work. Same thing when you submit an extension request. Instead of saying, you know, buyer approved your extension request, it says, but buyers responded. Yeah, they responded to the orders, resolution yeah. center request or something. And it's like, ugh. Yeah. yeah. Before we move on, I'm just going to read really, really quickly a list of other negative things. There was no transparency about search rankings. They arbitrarily hold onto our money for somewhere between one and three weeks after we've earned it, just because they can. I assume they do what uh, Venmo does and they invest it and sort of use it as a pool of cash. Interesting. Um, why? It's for money. It's very difficult to sell, tell sellers apart. There are frequent changes to site organization that are typically not announced. Like most sellers don't even know what happens until they go through the category tree and realize that the category was deleted. So within that challenge of trying to please everyone, super cheap buyers who want to scam people, you have high ticket clients with legit businesses who want true talent. You've got vetted experts like us who are true experts in our field. And then you've got new sellers. Fiverr is supposed to yeah. cover that entire spectrum. Have you seen an improvement or a decline in them trying to strike a fair balance between all of those groups? From what I've seen, it looks to me like they're doubling down pretty hard on pro sellers and high ticket buyers, in particular members of the Fiverr business program. Uh, but it seems like those are the only people who are getting a lot of focus. Super experienced, long time, top rated sellers who are not pro certified sellers feel like they've been thrown under the bus repeatedly. Pro for me has been a really positive shift. I am personally happy that Fiverr is leaning towards the upper side of things and is kind of trying to transition who their target buyer is. It's a huge leap of faith to go pro and to have to remake your gigs yeah. with no reviews because reviews are so powerful on the platform. Absolutely. And so... Especially if it's six years of reviews. Exactly. I, I really struggled with the decision with thousands of reviews on my gigs to yeah. go and restart completely new. But the good thing for me was that that happened like three and a half years ago. And I was like one of the very first pro sellers in the program. I've been yeah. extremely lucky with timing to get into that when I did so that I'm already rolling. But to kind of penalize right. sellers for not being willing to trust Fiverr's direction and not go pro and then kind of leave them hanging with that untapped or unfocused <laughs> audience that they're no longer right. trying to care about, that's not really fair for them. I also think the decision to, to not carry over reviews is a great example of like just a random miscellaneous purposeless screw you to the seller. I know. I mean, I get it. I, I don't want to be that guy who gets special treatment for... It's not special treatment. It's accurately preserving the record. It's hard because they have to make rules that fit for everyone. So to some extent, they have to be generic. They have to be for the benefit of all, even if it hurts some, because they are mm -hmm. that overlaying leader you know, of a platform, but I should be valuable to yes. them and that that should impact their decisions. And I don't always feel like that's true. It just feels clueless sometimes what decisions do and don't get made. For those of us who get to be managed sellers, I do think that that's a huge upside. But there's a weird feeling to it, right? Because you don't become a managed seller unless you've already succeeded. Rich get richer and everyone else is just screwed. And you made it. You've established yourself as a seller. Your business is doing fine. Now we provide the one resource. That's the one thing that can help you, you know, climb out of poverty or build a career or learn the learn what you need to start succeeding as a freelancer. I get that from their perspective as like, a, these are our most valuable sellers. They generate the most revenue for us. Let's protect them and support them and make sure they don't leave the platform, God forbid. 
this the managed sellers thing is top tier. Early on when I first started in 2013, 2014, customer service was amazing. Anytime I had any request, if I could screenshot something and say, this is what yeah. I said, this is what happened, they'd be like, here you go, we've got you covered. And then all of a sudden, like 2015, 16, 17-ish, I don't know, all of a sudden the terms of service became the rule book and everything was automated to, oh, well, I see what you're saying, but actually TOS says I can't do that, so sorry, you're out of luck. And it was this this yeah. instant shift of like, well, what the heck, yeah. I used to be supported. And now it's like, there's no, That's really there's no leeway at all. And it's always going to the buyers, not to the sellers. That was this huge shift I felt. And so then when they created wow. this, the managed program, I felt like that was them trying to rectify that. I can go to my managed seller and say, this is what happened. I really think I'm right. And he's like, you know, technically I think that customer service won't be able to help you, but I yeah. can. I trust no. you and I see what's going on and I'm a human and I, I wanna help you. <laughs> I think that every single seller should have access to a manager. You need to have someone that you can actually go to who has your back. That is what Fiverr yes. is currently missing, especially for people who can't break in because there's yep. something usually technical that's not working for them. Yeah, or, or they just don't know how to navigate the system. Mm -hmm. well. I mean, there's a, a lot of it that's opaque and has to be discovered through trial and error or like reading the forums and dealing with these weird rumors about like, well, if you really want to improve your on-platform SEO, you've got to, you know, do a ritual at the dark of the moon and dance around three times and sacrifice a goat. And that's that's how you're going to get some attention. I think they do have this in-between role where they support us and they solve technical issues and they protect us from the worst parts of freelancing. But then also they are pushing us into new categories and trying to get us to post new gigs. And part of that's probably good. If you're not a driven person who maybe doesn't know how to grow or you just feel stuck, then that kind of coach mentality of someone within Fiverr saying, this is what's coming up, here's what your options are. I think that that's good. So like Okay, here's more of a philosophical question. Do you personally consider yourself to be an employee of Fiverr or an employee in the gig economy? We are Fiverr's workers. Whether we're legally employees or not is, is like this complicated, interesting issue. Mm -hmm. We generate all of their revenue. We provide all of their services. Every cent Fiverr's ever earned was either taken directly from revenue we earned through our work or was investment, which is essentially someone buying themselves a slice of future revenue earned from our work. So... We are the workers who, who power this company. They should be giving us protections and benefits of some kind. What could Fiverr do immediately today that would most uh, promote healthier work conditions and expectations? I think that giving us a toggle to accept or decline orders is immediately something that they could do to allow sellers to have more flexibility and promote health, like better outcomes for buyers and kind of setting more human expectations of how the platform looks and feels. A couple years ago, they they turned it from looking like an email inbox to looking like an IM chat. And I noticed a drastic difference in how people message me. I think that's insightful and very much on point, yeah. And then the third, I think, is a much bigger thing, but they need to actively value and police fair pricing of work. And I don't know how they do that, but that needs to happen. You're right. I, I want to agree with you. I think your three are probably more important than any of the three I would mention. I think that was a phenomenal answer. The three I would pick would be search ranking transparency. Tell us how it works. Tell us what matters. Tell us what doesn't work. Two, give us guidance of some kind. Expand and manage seller program. Give us tool tips and advice. Here's what a good profile looks like. Here's what good gigs look like. Um, and then take less money is the last one. Okay. <laughs> Charging commission on tips makes absolutely no sense because they clearly <laughs> have the tools to police yeah. the language that we use with our buyers. If you even start to talk about sharing an email, right, right red flag, they could do the same thing with tips. <laughs> like they clearly can do it. Yes. If they cap it at 20% because no one reasonably tips more than 20%, right. it's so possible. So looking at room to improve, what would a seller yes. run platform look like if it was designed exclusively by and for sellers? Obviously don't take 20%. The short answer though is, is like be minimal. Yeah. Give us the core features that you offer us and, and f*** off with everything else. <laughs> and stop trying to be this giant for-profit conglomerate of debt. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this and to talk so candidly. Yeah, I've, I've appreciated your perspective. I feel a little bit more positive than I did um, before starting. 
Oops, I forgot to film an outro. Thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in joining Fiverr, buying on Fiverr, or learning freelance copywriting from me, please be sure to check out those links in the description box below because you are gonna help me out so much and I really appreciate you, so thank you. Again, I really wanna drive home the fact that although this conversation was very frank, like very frank, and I wasn't always 100% championing and excusing some of the decisions that the platform makes, I want this to be for our benefit, for everyone's benefit as the gig economy as a whole, freelance platforms as a whole, Fiverr specifically, continues to get better and improve and innovate and work towards having a positive impact on the world, which I do believe is their real true focus. I hope that this provides some really, really clear thoughts on what we are asking for and need and expect as career freelancers making a living doing this. I think there's a lot of hope. I think there's a lot of good stuff coming our way. So I wish you the very best. Let's get back to work.